Happy Wednesday. That's Billy Harner. My name is Keith Brad. This is the Slice of Life, our show with the Brooklyn Cyclones, where we bring the best possible stories to your timeline during quarantine. We are hoping and praying and crossing our fingers that it will all end soon. But while we wait, we'll try to help you out. We'll start it off with our favorite social slice. Billy, last night, shared a couple of delicious tacos with the, uh, the lady patrolling Twitter, as I do uh, about... 14 minutes every hour on the hour these days. Uh, and I came across the continuation of now the the office versus friends debate, which I don't know, which is a better show. So in my opinion, it would be the office hands down. And I know friends is taking a dive like European soccer. If you don't do well, they move you to a lower level. It was friends versus Seinfeld, which was not even a competition. Now I guess it's friends versus the office. But what I was looking at was Jimmy Mitchell's fine digital work of a basketball portrayal of The Office versus Friends. And as I'm thinking about the battle, I looked a little bit closer. This is unbelievable. Jimmy Mitchell, also known as the Creative Services Director for the Chicago Bulls, put these jerseys together. And Billy, you of all people know how amazing the, the craftsmanship and creativity goes into a theme night or changing a design for a team, or alternate jerseys. These jerseys are actually fire. What did you think? Yeah, I mean, my initial thing when I looked at it was it's like the Oklahoma City Thunder uniforms that he he morphed into it. But the detail with like the Central Perk logo on the side, and uh, even in the background, you look at the, the photo, there's like on the ribbon boards, there's the, the slogan, uh, uh, paperless world, infinite paper for a paperless world from the office is back there and uh, where friends meet with a central perk logo on the, another ribbon board. So he even put advertising in it. It was really cool to see the, uh, some of the matchups that he had uh, <laughs> on the court were a little questionable. So I think the office would run away hands down with that one. I don't think Phoebe could take Jim Halpert on the block, but uh, <laughs> it was, you know, it's, it's another, another example of people having some free time and using their, their skills to, to make us all entertained. So a good job from Jimmy. Yeah. Um, for, for my, for my, uh, social slice, um, this morning I, I saw that, uh, hashtag the real heroes has started trending, uh, and it, as a nod to the well-deserved celebration of national nurses day. And it's something that athletes across the country from Christian Yelich, uh, to Alex Morgan, to Wayne Gretzky, to Drew Brees, to Donovan Mitchell, um, all, all sports all over the country, all walks of life. Um, they're starting to post photos of themselves holding up their uniform, uh, crossing out their name and putting the names of a healthcare worker, whether it be a doctor or a nurse or other medical uh, worker, to give some sign, uh, shine to the doctors and nurses and medical uh, personnel that have been working tirelessly throughout this whole thing. Um, the trend is also they're encouraging fans to do the same thing at home uh, with some of your jerseys to pay your respects or homage to uh, someone you know or a doctor, nurse, whoever you're dealing with. So I figured right here on Slice of Life, we'd, we'd get it started for ourselves. I have my Eli jersey, so she knows exactly how much this means to me. Uh, for Beth Tassillo, who has been one of my best friends my whole life, uh, she works in Mamadi's Hospital and has been working tirelessly this whole time. She's also the mom of a 10-month-old son, so how she's doing double duty uh, is nuts. Um, but just, you know, one example and someone who's very close to me and someone that I've never been more proud to be uh, connected with uh, during this whole thing. So uh, props to Beth and everybody else that are, are working tirelessly. And I encourage people out there to, to sort of get involved with this as well. Keith, who you yeah. got? I, uh, I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll roll this into my chicken parm heroes and National Nurses Day. I mean, the, the whole tradition now that is going on with, with the jerseys is pretty cool. I mean, I... I don't own a jersey in my small New York City apartment. It was part of the got to leave this behind kind of thing because I only have a closet that's this big. But if I had a jersey, I would definitely put a couple of friends' names on it. Uh, I live 150 yards from uh, Lenox Hill Hospital, Hospital for Special Surgery. So I see them every single day going to and from work. And we live above a Dunkin' Donuts. And we were just commenting the other day that uh, when we started to see nurses and and in the area – like go to Dunkin' Donuts, walk down the street with like an iced coffee. There was almost a little bit of a lightness about them. And that was, for us, something to see that's like, hey, we're getting out of this. Like if nurses are kind of like chilling out a little bit, having some coffee, to me, it wasn't saying anything about 
they're relaxed, but it was saying that maybe things inside that big hospital are getting a little bit better because from the looks on the outside, I feel like Charlie looking at the, you know, the Wonka factory, like what is going on in there? Because there's this steam coming out in the building and uh, it's a big, scary uh, brick building, but uh, just a little thing of seeing the nurses walk by with coffee and they're chatting and they're almost having a good time. It was very relieving for us to, to see that because they have been working tirelessly. And the, the, the image that'll stick out in my head for this is, I mean, I wear the mask to go to the supermarket for an hour. I mean, they're wearing these masks that are just sucked against your skull for 10, 12 hours a day. It has got to be brutal. I can barely handle it for an hour when I go get bread and milk. Um, so obviously I don't know everything that's gone on inside that hospital, but, uh, thank goodness for all of them because, um, this is starting to pass and we're, we can all get a nice coffee pretty soon. Yeah. I've, I've sort of looked at, you know, my friends that are in, in, in hospitals and in, in the medical field as sort of like the, uh, canary in the coal mine. Um, you know, they're giving me a little taste of what, what life is like. And when they start to not act completely normal, but a little more, you know, they have time to speak on the phone. They have time to, you know, one of my, one of my neighbors uh, went out for a bike ride with their kid yesterday. So like they're, you know, you're starting to see things where, you know, they're not totally entirely consumed with this, which um, is, is, is a good trend that we like to see. Um, for my chicken farm hero, um, the food industry has obviously been turned upside down by this, this whole pandemic. Um, and there's been a lot more supply than demand uh, because of the number of restaurants that have been closed. Um, but rather than slowing production or letting the food go to waste, New York State farmers recently donated 34,000 pounds of milk and beef and produce to families in need, uh, specifically focused in uh, East Elmhurst and Queens. Um, so this included over 300 pounds of beef, 1,700 gallons of milk, uh, apples, yogurt, uh, blueberries, strawberries, all that stuff. So um, they're able to donate this food to families that were uh, hard hit by this or in impacted communities. Um, so rather than just stopping what you're doing, stop production, throwing things out, finding other ways to use them, um, they're giving them to the people in need. So that started last weekend uh, in East Elmhurst. They were giving away to local congressman's uh, congress. Yeah, I think it was a state senator or congressman, whatever it was, um, giving away some the food from there, and using that as the the hub for it. So um, a great job by our farmers, obviously, for keeping us all fed throughout this whole thing, but also not letting items go to waste and finding good ways to use them. Yeah, definitely. That's that's one of the things that you're seeing now. I mean, especially with food. Uh, restaurants, I, I see the, when I walk down the street, restaurants here are still getting somewhat close to their same food deliveries that they would normally have. And there's a big bag of carrots I saw the other day for a, a restaurant that's definitely not turning out that many carrots you know per week so a lot of this food is going to waste but it's good to see people coming together to i mean donate it because uh everyone needs needs a bite to eat i mean i literally my day revolves around what i'm gonna have after this show for lunch uh so yes food is uh obviously a huge thing and that's that's great to see sports go right back to you on this one because i know that you saw something that i liked as well last night so the, uh, the Last Dance and ESPN's documentary has sort of been on the top of everybody's mind and what everybody's been talking about for the last uh, three weeks or so, or probably even before that when it was sort of announced that it was getting pushed forward. So um, old school basketball has sort of been pushed back to the forefront here uh, and reintroduced to a lot of uh, new audience on social media. So yesterday on uh, Bleacher Report, there was one such story that uh, started to go viral about Larry Bird during the 1986 season. Uh, to be precise, it was Valentine's Day, 1986, uh, where, as legend has it, the story is told by Bill Walton. So, you know, that's take it for, for what it is. But it's been <laughs> confirmed by a couple other sources. So that's why I went with it. Um, the night before the game, it was the last game of a road trip for the Celtics. And they were going to play the Portland Trailblazers in Portland. Uh, the night before the game, Larry Bird told his teammates and the media that he was going to save his right hand for the Lakers, who they were playing when they returned to Boston. So tomorrow, I'm just going to play with my left hand, which by itself is just legendary. Absolute, complete, and utter just disrespect for whoever your opponent is. Like, I play left-handed against my son, but he's five. Like, I'm not playing against other peers and professionals. Uh, so 
that by itself is a good enough story. But then when you take into account what he actually did, which was put up 47 points with 14 rebounds and 11 assists while scoring uh, 10 of his 21 field goals exclusively with his left hand uh, and put up a triple-double against another NBA franchise is just absolutely insane and the stuff of uh, legend to begin with. And that's absolutely why he will forever be Larry Legend. Unbelievable story. I read this and I was thinking like, okay, I've played basketball, obviously not on the level of high school or college, but does my, like my right wrist hurt after I'm done playing? Like, does he really need to rest his right wrist basically? And uh, also just the level of disrespect is unbelievable for, you guys mentioned uh, Valentine's Day, no love for the the trailblazers that, that night. Uh, is could you say this is like Pete Alonso batting lefty three at bats and going like two for three with two doubles? I, what would you what do you say to that? Yeah, I mean that's that's basically you know like if you're Jacob Degrom and you have struck out seventeen guys and you just decide you know what I'm just going to start throwing lefty at this point <laughs> you know like or you're you're playing the Marlins and they're on a twelve game losing streak and you just say let's just roll it out there and see what I could do left-handed. Like that is, I can't imagine ever being a that good at something where I could just do that. Um, and, and B just not caring and just get and doing it like insane. And I get, you know, I've talked, you know, we are around athletes, you're, you're in the grind and things like that of 82 games in an NBA season. And you're just trying to find a way to entertain yourself when you're the Celtics and you know that you're just on a collision course to play Lakers in the finals. So finding a way to keep yourself entertained, but this was just, Absolutely savage on Larry Bird's part. <laughs> so that was then. This is now good news. Uh, live sports somewhat returning to the United States of America. Premier Lacrosse today announced they're going to hold a 16-day, 20-game, no-fans tournament. They're going to find a location for this somewhere in the mid-Atlantic, southeast, midwest. It's going to be on NBC Network July 25th to August 9th. This is a great move, by the way, for the Premier uh, Lacrosse League, which, by the way, is still in its infancy trying to um, get in front of eyeballs as best as possible. And everyone is starving for sports. So a good move by their their leadership to, to get this going, because I'm sure NBC Networks is going, please, you know, anything that anybody has, let's get it. Uh, 16-day tournament. I mean, is, is that as nuts as March Madness? March Madness is... You know, two or three or four weeks. So this is going to consume everybody for a little bit. And you're going to just turn on the tube and, and see some random game going on wherever. And I mean, 16 days is enough to build a habit, I guess, right? Two weeks or so. So uh, awesome news. Yeah, l- lacrosse on TV is actually pretty entertaining. Like I was never a lacrosse guy growing up. I wasn't really that big of a sport when I was a kid. Um, when I went to college, I started to learn about it being thrown into the fire with working in the SID's office. Um, Being on Long Island now, it's sort of everywhere. So um, I've sort of developed an appreciation for it. But on TV, it's it's very exciting. So this is a good opportunity for them to sort of showcase their sport uh, in a standalone sort of people starving for live things. Um, Any type of live action is is going to be something that people are going to want to tune into. I'm interested to see because all the sports that have come back so far have been baseball, which isn't really a contact sport in terms of being close to a defender or uh, running into each other hitting each other, things like that. Um, you know, occasionally you'll have the, the, the guy at first holding on a runner or something like that, but you're not trying to tackle a guy and hit him with a stick. So um, seeing how this will translate in terms of what they're going to do and with precautions and, you know, because of the close contact, the testing of people and things like that. So I think this will be a good precursor for what potentially could be involved with football when that starts to come back. So uh, anything live I'm here for, anything new and different and uh, will be exciting for sure. And uh, looking forward to any type of sport that's actually in the United States. So this will be probably the first of that other than, you know, professional wrestling and maybe UFC, I guess. So it'll be uh, a good start. Yeah, I don't uh, foresee wake saying up till 1 a.m. just to start a baseball game in Korea. It's great. It's great. No, don't get me wrong. But uh, maybe at like a two o'clock in the afternoon in Akron, Ohio might be a good plan. <laughs> Now, now the the KBO is at five thirty in the morning. Some of us are up at five thirty in the morning, Keith. You know, we have we have kids who act like roosters, and they wake up at the crack of dawn. So five thirty baseball is right in my wheelhouse. Things to look forward to in my life. Not quite yet, though. Not quite yet. Uh, not quite yet either for us to get back to normal. That's why slice of life rolls on. Billy, we'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Have a great day. <laughs>